This is the Jeff Santos Show. 33 minutes uh, past the hour. It is the Jeff Santos Show that you are tuned into. We're here every Monday through Friday, 3 to 6 Eastern Time. And, of course, uh, we are uh, on Pacific Time from 12 to 3 p.m. That's where we go once again. We were in Los Angeles just a few minutes ago with our good friend, uh, Mr. Joe Sandberg. We go up the coast, Interstate 5, where we find our good friend, uh, Mark Taylor Canfield, the Renaissance man of the Jeff Santos Show. You can follow him on Twitter at M. Taylor Canfield. He follows us, and we are so great to have the Renaissance Man on the program. You can find him on also Democracy Watch News, which is getting some added funding. Yay for that. Uh, the great work that he and, uh, and, and others do there. And, uh, of course, um, it is always great to have a musician uh, on the Jeff Santo Show. And we bring in our good friend, Mr. MTC. To the microphones of the Jeff Santos Show. Happy Friday, Mark. That's my intro since uh, we we aren't doing music. Yeah, you don't don't have the music yet. That's right. Well, it's okay. It's live, man. You're at the studio today, so we're uh, getting good, 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 good acoustics anyways. Good, good stuff. Yeah, we're in the studio. I'm playing my beloved guitar that I kiss every night before I go to bed. Uh, <laughs> my three quarter size with the so we're good on that. But I um, <laughs> I do have a you know there's a little jealousy issue sometimes with my girlfriend, but you know I try to explain that to her. And that, you know it doesn't need to get in between us. But um, I'm playing through this Marshall Chew Bamp, which is oh Jeff, it's my favorite favorite sound. It's like if you think about. Uh, a lot of ZZ Top you've heard, or maybe a lot of other major rock bands, you know. It's got that really crunchy sound. Yeah, a little bit of Eddie Van Halen maybe there too, you know. Yeah, it's the perfect rock sound for me. I found my voice. I mean, you know, some musicians and vocalists and guitarists struggle their whole lives trying to find that unique sound that they really, really like and that really expresses themselves. Uh, the best as an artist, and I found it. It's a Marshall amp, a tube amp with a, a humbucker, and it's a little three-quarter size Super Strat, if people know what I'm talking about. Um, and it's just, you know, it's my favorite guitar. The strings are real kind of loose, so I can get a lot of bend on them, and a lot of hammer-ons, and kind of that Jimi Hendrix kind of style thing, where he used a lot of his fingers on the fretboard, actually, to make the sounds. And then, uh, you know, just... The whole idea of rock and roll is so much fun. And so all night long uh, in the studio recording a new song, um, there are a few political references in it, but it's mostly just a, a song for fun. It's rock and roll, and it's just kind of trying to get people to relax a little bit, you know, and loosen up a little bit um, and get that rock and roll feeling. And uh, I think uh, if you look at some of the outdoor shows that are going on in Seattle and that are coming up, I think Seattle's starting to get that feeling again. I went to a really great reggae show at Gasworks Park last week with a good friend, and you know, we put up our hammocks and kind of kicked back and listened to the reggae and the sunshine. It was so nice. It was really great to hear live music, and the people really appreciated it. They had a really great response from the crowd that showed up. So the uh, weather hasn't been that late here. It's been kind of, you know, so-so, the typical cloudy, chilly weather in Seattle. So good opportunity and good excuse for the last few days, at least, to be in the studio and just work on some new music. There's no place I would rather be, to tell you the truth, um, Joe. Well, I mean, you, you, do, you, you belong in the studio, man. I mean, also you belong on live stage uh, and so forth. But that's that's still an issue. Uh, but, and, you know, I know that that's something we want to talk about before we... Uh, before we leave, because we need to get you, uh, you know, back uh, on center stage. But, you know, one of the things that's what we've been talking about today, and I want to get your thoughts, because I know that the uh, mayor of Seattle is doing at least the right thing for the next month, but there are a lot of people that are falling through the cracks in smaller towns. That's the eviction notice that uh, was given to uh, the American people by the Supreme Court. Uh, six of them, of course, Republicans, um, uh, and, and, of course, all six, I should say, are Republicans, and, you know, and three from Trump and one term. I mean, that to me is just disgusting. And, um, you know, that, that leaves people out in the streets. Uh, we just talked to Joe Sandberg down there in Los Angeles, which has had a massive problem with homeless issues. Uh, I know Seattle has their own. Uh, and, of course, the expensive rent uh, that the Bezos uh, crowd and others have put uh, upon people in Seattle uh, makes it that much worse. Uh, tell us uh, the latest. 
Well, the latest from Seattle report, this is Mark Taylor Canfield reporting live from Seattle where Mayor Jenny Durkin did sign um, some legislation, a uh, city ordinance to extend the eviction moratoriums in Seattle until September 30th. So, well, you know, one more month. Uh, that is good for the folks who live in Seattle. Uh, however, the statewide uh, prohibition on uh, evictions has been lifted most of, mostly. So smaller towns, uh, not mostly, I would say it's actually been lifted for, for specific reasons. But there's still some protection for people in Washington State um, on the rent issue, a failure to, to pay the rent or inability to pay the rent. So that's going to happen for another month in Seattle. Uh, as you said, in smaller towns around the state, people aren't quite so protected. Uh, so that so that is happening. But, to, you know, in my mind, it's just another one of those um, social uh, issues that have never really been addressed in, in our major cities especially, and that is, you know, how to create affordable housing for people. Because if the homes uh, for families are too expensive for working class folks to buy, and if the rents are too high for anyone except professionals to afford, then what what do you do with the working class? Have you just sort of created, and, and people living in poverty, have you just sort of created a permanent underclass there? Is that the way that society is going to work now? I don't think that that's sustainable, and it's certainly not in Seattle or or San Francisco or Los Angeles or other major cities uh, on the West Coast and the East Coast where the houseless population is growing. And, you know, city governments are going to have to figure out what to do about this. Now, they can hem and haw about neoliberal policy and try to please the, uh, the corporatists um, with all sorts of tax breaks, you know, for major real estate development. But they've got to do something to protect uh, the culture and the economy in their local region, too. You can't just uh, give away the store. So, unfortunately, that's one of the battles we've been fighting in Seattle. And I'm, I'm a little bit worried, Jeff, that um, someone that I've known for a long time, so you know, nothing personal against the guy, but I'm a little bit worried that the current uh, candidate for mayor here, Bruce Hill, who was not endorsed by Bernie Sanders, he actually endorsed Bruce's opponent, Lorena Gonzalez, um, but I'm a little bit afraid that Bruce might try to go a sort of a centrist path here and try to please both sides, which would include the major corporations here and the billionaires, and also try to um, kiss up to progressives at the same time. But I don't think that's going to work. I don't think you can do both. People have got to get a spine and stand up for the working class and the poor people in this town. I mean, how much longer... Uh, are they going to go unrepresented in our political system? That's what I'm looking at it um, as a journalist and as an artist. You know, when writing this music, sometimes I'm thinking about just the un unrepresented and the voiceless. And I can just be very clear as a journalist and say that uh, the the ability for the working class and, and poor folks in the United States to gain political representation has not been very effective. And they don't really have a party that speaks for them, or, uh, um, I mean, presumably the progressives in the Democratic Party, for instance, our congressman, Pernilla Jayapal, and others are working for that and do understand, being an immigrant herself, she understands what it's like to come to this country with nothing, you know, and have to start all over and live in poverty. She knows all of that, so she has some sympathy for that and has, didn't enter politics in order to, you know, pad her bank account. But you can't always find that in Congress. In fact, it's pretty rare. So, uh, one yeah, of the I would say that to be the case, so really, unfortunately, tragically. There are too many people who uh, go there and get richer uh, and, uh, you know, uh, pound their, uh, their chest uh, that they are a millionaire. Uh, you know, when they started with, uh, you know, making 150000 or whatever it was a few years ago as a member of Congress, and uh, they're coming out millionaires, you know, both sides of the aisle, tragically. Yeah, I, it's, there's a lack of representation in the media as well. I see that as a journalist. That's why I'm glad to see a lot of new startups and nonprofits popping up, and especially people of color managing their own news agencies and you know getting beyond these barriers that they have experienced and that women have experienced in, in corporate media. Uh, we really need to move beyond that so that there are other kinds of uh, progressive and independent media, such as your program, um, so that um, more 
more diverse voices can be heard in this country, and we have a, a more wide uh, political and cultural spectrum, that would really help. I think um, when it comes to politics, uh, the Democrats have got to decide whether they're going to be uh, with the working class and the poor or whether they're going to be with the corporations. And when they try to do both, they typically fail. And I'm a little bit worried that that's what's going to happen with Bruce Harrell is that he will try to please everyone and then end up being unliked by everyone. Um, is he a leading candidate for mayor in this, uh, in this up- upcoming uh, Seattle primary? I mean, uh, Washington, uh, yeah, Seattle primary for mayor? Well, surprisingly, you know, I really thought, uh, as I said before, I thought that uh, Colleen Echohawk really came out of the starting gate a bit ahead of everyone and more organized than everyone, but Bruce was able to garner a lot of money, so he definitely yeah, had that usually helps. sort of a business. <laughs> and that's the other issue in the political world is where is the funding coming from? Uh, Public-funded campaigns in Seattle uh, have have been taken over now by out-of-state money and by, um, you know, business interests. So suddenly this idea that we all have these democracy vouchers and we would get to decide as the people uh, who is going to be mayor uh, instead of, you know, powerful lobbyists for corporate interests. Unfortunately, there's a lot of money coming in from out-of-state for Bruce, and there were some other candidates in the primaries, too, that were sort of supported by business interests. So sometime, some way you've also got to find a way of funding um, independent media and independent politics. And that's another missing thing. Uh, when you go around and you see who's on the board of directors for uh, a lot of you know major corporations, of course, they all have uh, moneyed connections and have money themselves. When you go to a nonprofit organization <laughs> who's actually trying to help you know immigrants and poor people, uh, they often have people on their board who aren't filthy rich and don't have those kind of connections and are always struggling to fund their organization. So we got to find ways of... Um, somehow creating models where we can fund publicly uh, financed uh, non-profit institutions to take care of people and also uh, we need to do that in media and in politics so that there's some way for the money to be there to support these causes and if that means we're going to have to get a lot better uh, as fundraisers ourselves or organizers or if you know some of the rich folks who claim to have um, progressive political leanings you know, um, if they really want to see change, they're going to have to pitch in. We can't expect poor and working class people to finance um, these kinds of movements because they, they're struggling to get by today, you know. That's a, it's a really difficult to ask people to contribute to a cause that is supposed to um, help them rise above poverty. You know, obviously they're in poverty to begin with or they wouldn't need the help. So you know, we got to develop new models and people have to be courageous and step out and, and speak out when they find them and share them with other people and create networks that will help all this happen. It's not going to come from the top down. Um, oh, no, but this is a grassroots a thing. No, we were talking yeah. earlier with Joe Siegel today, and he was talking about, you know, a Gandhi-like approach of, you know, uh, groups, uh, small groups, particularly in the COVID times, uh, of trying to uh, rally people and, and basically to stop, you know, the 1% and their, um, you know, their, their production machines, if you might, um, of, of just uh, rolling out people at, you know, 8 bucks an hour and, the, and profiting the, the, you know, the, the 1%, profiting the CEO and the CFO and everybody else and everybody uh, you know, outside of the top two or three people in the company, you know, end up with uh, with uh, you know basically coal in their in their um, uh, in their stockings. So that's that's the reality of it, and it's, and it's tragic. And I want to take a quick call from you, from my good friend Joe in uh, Arizona. Uh, we haven't heard from him in a while. Joe, you're next on the uh, Jeff Santos Show with Mark Taylor Canfield. Go right ahead, Joe. That all the weak punk Democrats who bring nothing to the table who are just sold out just as much as the Republicans. I, you know, I'm telling you what, well, man, I just, I don't really see it. I don't see it well, happening. Well, let me, let me try to sort of, I, I think, and I, I want to get Mark in on this. I think that there are a number of Democrats who act like Republicans. We saw the nine or the 12, whatever, the corporate uh, jerks that ended up uh, trying to drag uh, the $3.5 trillion right into the sewer uh, that they were talking about that uh, Bernie Sanders and others put together. There are, um, whether there are 10, Rep- 10 Democrats in, you know, led by Bernie Sanders, who's technically an independent, but would have been a Democrat if it was any other state but Vermont, 
Democrat, which has the option to be an independent. Um, and, of course, the caucus is with the Democrats. And about 100 members led by uh, our good friend, uh, Mark's good friend, Ms. Jayapal. So there are good Democrats. It's just not enough. And frankly, what we have seen in this issue with the eviction notices is, is by the Supreme Court is a perfect example of the two parties. The three Democrats appointed by Obama and Clinton, they all voted no. The ones that stole the elections, Trump and Bush, uh, two, that was five of the six. The other one, of course, is Clarence Thomas, who's been there for seemingly forever uh, and was appointed in, you know, by, uh, by George H.W. Bush. So... You know, there is a distinction, but it should be a lot more. And I agree with you that we cannot continue uh, to have a Democratic Party that does not rise to the occasion, particularly in a place like this with the eviction issue. Uh, so you're right on there, Joe. I wouldn't give up yet, and please don't become a Republican. We don't need more of them. Well, I know you, you think maybe you can reform them, but we, 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 have, we have enough people who have gone to that bed. Because if you think you're, you're, you're making no uh, progress with the Democrats, you might as well just give up with the Republicans because, you know, they're all about me and profit and the 1%. They want no part of, of Joe Sixpack from Arizona, I can tell you that. So. Yeah, but if, 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 you can't, if you can't make the case when Rome is on fire and you say, we are a fire department, we have water to put it out, and we can't. I mean, like, literally, you know, I'm not even talking about those 10 putzes that have been bought by the Chamber of Commerce because, you know what, the Republicans don't like them anyways they you know i mean like my republican cousins i come from a wicked red weird republican family uh in wisconsin and let me tell you what they do not get nancy pelosi's corporate politics they think she's a just a big you know dance yeah, yeah. theater yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. wine um course, you know they don't get the ice cream the whole uh, thing yeah yeah, hey, can I, I go, go, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead, Mark? Go ahead, Mark. I want to get you. Yes, Mark's Mark. 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 So, I mean, party affiliation is is one thing, okay? Um, but it doesn't necessarily define anybody as an individual. So you can be, you can be a member of a party and have your own independent thoughts. And you you know you you know I know uh, the party whip would not like me to say that if I especially if I were a member of Congress. And, you know, and sometimes you do have to create coalitions in order to get um, bills passed. That's just part of politics. But um, I would just say, number one, uh, I do, you know, I would definitely hesitate to associate with a political party uh, that has some very openly racist and fascist people as members. Uh, and that's, I'm not saying that the, the Democrats are the perfect party in any way, and I think that it's very important, uh, whatever your party affiliation, to be an equal opportunity critic. So I will definitely criticize uh, the Democrats, and sometimes, you know, we're harder on our friends than we are on our enemies, right, because we expect more. Um, yes, exactly. But always be, be careful not to, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're talking about a political world here, and it's very subtle, and I know people try to make it into... Uh, five, ten second sound bites and try to control a lot of people's thinking with uh, quick slogans or um, buzzwords, but the, in reality, it's a very subtle game, and so um, I would not um, generalize about anything. Also, when you get to the point, except for maybe, you know, um, violations of human rights and fascism, you know, is not going to be supported um, from me. It doesn't matter what your party affiliation is. The other thing is, is that uh, I'm com I come from a part of the country where, like, uh, our city elections are um, nonpartisan. So, although it's very clear, you know, that there there is not a Republican candidate currently that made it through the primary system. So sometimes you do get two Democrats in Washington State um, running against each other, and that you know I know that seems kind of weird, but we have a instant runoff voting primary system. No, there's a and lot of places part. that have the independents, uh, you know, and, and, you know, they don't run as an NP uh, senior and nonpartisan. So, you know, I don't have a problem with that at the local level in particular because you just want to get people who really care about the community. Um, and Seattle so, has proven that they have a lot of people, and that's how you and get up to $15 minimum wage and, and so yeah. forth. And, and if I'm not mistaken, Joe, I mean, yeah. Tucson, you know, is a relatively, uh, you know, progressive community. I mean, it's it's not Berkeley, but you know, in comparison to Phoenix, it's it's a little bit more progressive, right? 
Absolutely. But my point is, is everything's been nationalized. Uh, and yes. when we yes. have been abandoned by the Democratic Party, like, you know, you look at the largest uh, protest by Black Lives Matter. That was the largest protest in history. Well, that's, that's, that's a great point. Dead. Dead. Yeah, the, the, that's why we need dead. to have a progressive populist uh, agenda. Yeah, uh, no, I so look, so you know, you, I mean, you're, you're right. <laughs> you can list a lot of the octogenarians or those who are about to be 80 years old. Uh, hey, Joe, we got to run, my friend, but thank you for the call. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot lot to talk about going forward. Uh, you know, Mark, uh, we have great, uh, great callers and listeners. I think the best in the country on this show, and Joe's a new example of that. You know, just about co coalition politics, because there's party politics and then there's coalition po politics. Yes, exactly. And I come from a part of the country... Where, and also I spent some time in Europe where coalition politics are very um, nor normalized. So you don't necessarily, you know, so what, you may be a member of a party, but that doesn't mean that you don't work with other parties. So maybe you're a member of the Green Party, but you also work with Democrats. And maybe you're a Democrat, but you would support a Green candidate for office. These, this is coalition politics. I and mean, when you're in any kind of legislative body, like in the city council or the state legislature or Congress, that's how you get um, bills passed. That's how you get things done. So the idea that you know party affiliation is the be all and end all of politics is just one way of looking at it. In reality, there's many different levels and ways of people cooperating. You can be a member of a political party and still work with other groups. You don't have to just you know uh, be a be a one trick pony. <laughs> That's all I want yeah, to say. no doubt about that. Hey, we just got about sixty seconds left here. Uh, tell me a little bit about the uh, the music that you're doing and. Uh, uh, you know, let us uh, go off on a uh, on a positive note here. Yeah, well, I'm writing a song, and it's been kind of going in my head for a long time, and it's kind of, some of it seems to be influenced a little bit by the Ramones, so it's kind of a party fun song, and we've been having a great time just playing it and kind of trying to play it straight without a lot of takes, you know, and be that get that raw rock and roll, good, fun sound, and I'm really happy with it, Jeff. It's sounding really good sounding really rocking, and that's not always easy to do in the studio, but I think if you have the right attitude about rock and roll and you really enjoy it, it comes across even in the studio, you know, so sounds good, the drum track sounds really great, which of course is the most important part, uh, everybody needs a drummer, so everybody have a great weekend and keep on rocking, you can check out my stuff at YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Mark Taylor Canfield, uh, Renaissance Man of the Jeff Santo Show, you have yourself a great weekend, my friend, we'll talk to you next Friday, all the best. And I want to thank uh, Ron Kreider for producing this broadcast. Uh, thank you for listening, folks. Uh, great callers, uh, great questions today, great comments. Uh, we're going we're gonna to come back on this uh, on Monday, uh, get the latest from Washington with our good friend Bob Kuzak. Thank you, folks, for listening. Have yourself a great weekend. Right now, my name is Jeff Santos, and it is my time to say I got to go.